don't have very much time left, but it's okay because I don't take very much time. I am a proud father, and I'm a proud youth leader. These guys did an amazing job, and uh, it's just such a blessing. What a blessing that life is. You know, there's times where you can get bogged down, and you can let life consume you, and you can let life come and just kick you right in the face. But there's so much to be thankful for. There's so much to be excited about. Focus on what is good in your life. Focus on the things that you can control, and don't worry about the things that you can't. Let God worry about those. Now on to the, my lesson here. Uh, we have, uh, we've been going through 1 Corinthians, and I am so honored that I'm able to uh, stand before uh, my, church, my church family and uh, walk us through the next couple of verses of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to start in verse 9. But I want to I set a ground, uh, a base before we uh, get started on this. Um, faith. According to the scriptures, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things that we can't see. Faith is what we cling to Jesus with. And we say, you know, Jesus, I can't see Jesus. I can't, I can't uh, put, put him in a box and put him to my side. But I have faith, just as much faith that he's here with me than as, as you guys are here with me myself. Faith is what we have. God has given us all a measure of faith. Every man has been given a measure of faith. But it is up to us. To grow on that faith. How do we grow our faith, you might ask? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Somebody wise once said that. I forgot who. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Our faith grows by reading the word of God. And coming to a place like this, or under a tree, or wherever you are, wherever the church is gathered, if we decide, and learning from what the Bible has to say to us. I'm glad I'm glad that, that you guys are here. I'm glad that we were able to, to open the, the word up and, and see. Our faith is not based on opinions, but it's, it's based on fact. And what, what is the, the basis of our fact is the gospel. Pastor Wes touched on this earlier this, or in the, this morning service, but the gospel is what makes everything make sense. Bad news, bad news is fantastic because we have to have the bad news to, have, to make the good news make sense. If not, it's just news. And it doesn't matter. But the gospel, the gospel is Jesus Christ, that Jesus, he came, he came in a human form, that he was, uh, he was perfect, he was sinless. His death on the cross as our substitute, as our propitiation, if you don't know what that means, it means substitute, it's a big, long word, and you, you can use it now, propitiation, it's hard to say, hard, I can't even spell it, but it's a word. Yeah, you're going to have to laugh, you're going to have to give me something here, you have to... <laughs> Okay, I've been sweating ever since we started watching these kids, making sure that they did everything right. And uh, I'm about ready to pass out. Good to keep going here. Not only is he our substitute, but the resurrection from the dead. His ascension back into heaven and his very, very soon second coming. They're all 100% gospel facts that we must believe. Uh, see, the lost denies these truths. People who are lost, they don't understand these truths. Of course they're going to they're gonna, uh, dis, uh, dis, uh, disengage from that fact. But it, that's what they do. It's the lost. If you start finding Christians or Christians who start denying any of these facts, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, then you might want to talk to them about who Jesus Christ is because they don't understand who he is. I was talking, uh, I was living in uh, the east side of Broken Arrow, and, and the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses uh, came over and they were talking to me. And uh, they, they, were, they caught me outside, me and my, my father, and they started talking to us. And my dad said something that kind of made me take a step back and say, what? He said, you believe in Jesus? We believe in Jesus? Can we all just get along? He said, he was talking to these people. He said, you believe in Jesus? Well, I believe in Jesus. Well, why are we arguing here? And I said, Dad, the reason why we're arguing is because they don't believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus and Nazareth, the Savior of the world, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who died on the cross, who was buried for my transgressions, for my sin, and rose again three days later, being victorious over death. That's my Jesus. That's the Jesus that I, I, I serve. That's the Jesus I hold up. That's the Jesus I, I tell people about because that's a Jesus worth having. That's a Savior worth having. And they don't, they don't have that same Savior. <laughs> It's not good to deny any of these facts. The resurrection of the dead has often been assailed. In the, in, uh, in the church of Corinth, there were some skeptics. 
The reason why there were some skeptics is because there were different people. You see, they had Sadducees there telling them that there was no resurrection. And see, that's why we call them sad. You see, don't you, don't you see? Don't you see why they're sad? They're sad, you see, because they don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus. That made me sad too. Pagan philosophies. Uh, they, they, take, they take what, what is truth and they just tear it apart. Paul is quick to deal with this church in Corinth, and as, as we're about to see, and he shows up and he teaches them of the resurrection and how the resurrection of the dead was a very fundamental truth in the gospel story. That without, uh, if you take it away, then you take away the power, of God, or the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel is lost without the resurrection. Without Jesus Christ becoming victorious with the, the keys of hell, the, the, the keys of death with him, then what's everything about? What's it all, what is the point of everything? So uh, let's go ahead and read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, starting in verse 9. <coughs> 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9 says, For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted this Paul. I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Isn't that a fantastic statement? And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than, all, uh, than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which is with me. Therefore, whether it be, were that I... Or they, so we preach, so you believe. We preach the gospel. You believe the gospel. Now if Christ be preached, that he rose from the dead, uh, how, some, some, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ not be risen, or be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith also vain, church? Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we te have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so, be that the dead not, uh, rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith, church, is vain. Ye are, not, or ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished, are perished away, are done, are done. They're they're gone. If in this, uh, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, get this: we are of all men most miserable. We are most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all died, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Well, and lastly, every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, I thank you for a night like this where we uh, are able just to come to this building and meet together, assemble as a church. And Father, I pray that we, we do what we're supposed to do. That Father, we come together to learn who you are and learn what's, what's important. And, Father, take that into a lost and dying world and apply it to our day-to-day -day life. Father, I pray that the ones here uh, will, will listen to what the Bible says. Not my words, but, but, Father, your words. Father, let us see the scripture and not the man speaking it. Father, let me hide behind the cross daily. I thank you for your word. I thank you for these kids that came and, and were helping out. And, and God, I pray that you, you, uh, you take them on in their life and you, you show them you show them what kind of man and what kind of young lady that you want them to be. And, Father, I pray that you give them the courage to take the steps to be, be all that they can be for you. Father, thank you for this, and everything I pray is in Jesus Christ's precious and holy name. Amen. See, I, I believe the church here at Corinth, we had a lot of, we had a lot of, text, a lot of verses here, but to, to get down to it, Paul is speaking to a certain group of people at a certain time. And Paul is talking to this church, <clears throat> talking to this church, and I think that the, the people in this church, they, they believed in the resurrection of Jesus at one point. If they didn't, then they weren't saved. If they didn't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then they, there's no hope, uh, according to what we just read. The Sadducees were, were uh, the, the group. Uh, when Jesus, oh, I'm sorry, when, uh, they didn't believe in the res resurrection of the dead. We see in Luke chapter 20. Uh, when Jesus went to raise a 12-year-old girl in Luke chapter nine, uh, 8, they laughed at him. They made fun of him. And uh, moving on, the, uh, 
it's sad. It's sad of what, what kind of people we run into. But well, those people are there nevertheless. So real quick, uh, before we run out of time, I want to go through a couple points here. And the first point uh, on your bulletin should be the, the protests to his resurrection. The protests to it. You know, Paul starts off by telling us what kind of man he was. And what kind of man Paul was wasn't a good man, right? He says, I'm not, I'm not fit to be what you've called me to be, God. I'm not worthy of being this because of what I've done. My past has, has blocked me, has hindered me from what I can do. And God said, no, 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 that's not, that's not accurate. Paul, I've, I've chosen you. You're a chosen vessel. I pulled you apart. I set you aside to do the things that I'm asking you to do. Be all you can be for God. For, do what God's telling you to do. Go to the Gentiles. Tell them about who Jesus Christ is. Tell them about his, uh, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and what they can be in Christ. Death, hell, these things aren't our, our, our end. That doesn't have to be your end. You can change. You can change your stars, even tonight. And even as Paul was telling these people, the same then is the same truth we have today. And I really like the verse where he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And by the, by the grace of God, you are who you are. And you've gone through what you've gone through for a reason. Allow God to use that reason through you. Be that person. If you're abused as a child, be that person who stands up for children. Be that person who gives voice to the ones who can't speak. If, uh, if you had people die in your life, relate to those who, who are, are going through the same struggles. Show them who Jesus Christ is. Be the church that God has called you to be. The protest of his resurrection, we have... Uh, we have different protests. You see in verse uh, 12 here, it says, Now if Christ be preached that he, uh, that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? We have different things. We have different uh, theories behind the, uh, the resurrection. I, I, have, I have just uh, three here that I wanted to point out. <laughs> the resuscitation theory. The resuscitation theory. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't look at all like I thought it would reading it on a piece of paper, resuscitation. But that's it. I put it in my, my Google. It told me. That's how you say it. There are several attempts to explain away the resurrection of Christ. There's a theory. This theory is the resuscitation theory. This is, this is actually saying that Jesus Christ went to the cross. He laid out his arms. He died, on, or he went to the cross. He, he laid out his arms. He was hammered. He was nailed to the cross. And he was lifted up. And the post slid into the hole. And he had that jolt, that, that jerk, and he hung there for hours. And then a centurion came by and put a spear through his side into his heart and came back down. And then whenever he gave up the ghost, whenever he died, or what this theory, the theory doesn't say he died, but the theory says that after all that, he passed out, probably from pain, <laughs> passed out. And he was taken down, he was taken into the tomb, and the cool, the cool tomb and the, uh, the, the, the ointments, the spike nard and whatnot, it revived him. Because that happens all the time. It revived him and he came alive. But you see, that theory doesn't, that bucket don't hold water. There are so many things that are wrong with that story that there's just a couple questions that aren't answered. The questions are, how did he get out of the tomb? If he, if he just came back alive, how did he get out of the tomb? How did he break out of the seal? How did the Roman soldiers not see him? And how did he go? And do the, and how, how could nobody find him? How, <laughs> oh, another thing, his disciples. If you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, you'll see how some of the disciples passed away. They're gruesome, gruesome ways. I think it was Matthew who was uh, uh, cut up uh, with a, uh, a big axe. And, the, and uh, John was the only one that wasn't, uh, that wasn't, Brutally executed. There was one, I think it was, I'm not going to say a name because I'll get it wrong, but there was one who I was reading about. He was drugged behind a chariot until he was nothing but pieces left. You think they, they held on to this lie? Just what was the purpose? What would be the reason if it was all a lie? Why in the world would they die such a hor horrible, hor or horrible, horrible, horrible death for a lie? They don't make any sense to me. The Christian science uh, cult accepts this, it accepts this account, and, but it leaves, like I said, it leaves many questions open. 
The next one is the, uh, the spirit ascension theory. This is the theory that says that only the spirit was revived. Uh, others, uh, others say that Jesus uh, did, they say that he did die. <coughs> but not only did he die, he stayed dead. But his spirit came back. But the problem with that is that we see that he was eating and drinking with his disciples. That he was seen of uh, uh, hundreds of people as we read this morning. So that, that, does, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't hold that water that I was hoping for. Uh, Jesus appeared to his disciples, and some had thought that he was a spirit. But Jesus said, Jesus said in uh, Luke 24, said, Handle me and see for yourselves. Put, put your fingers in the, in the holes, in the nail holes. Put your hand in my side. Talking to Thomas. When Jesus bought... Uh, and also, another question was, what, what, would happen, what would happen to Jesus' body for examination? What happened to, to the body, the evidence? It, it doesn't make sense. And if it does, if it did, then the disciples were deceivers and liars above everything else. Lastly, on these theories, ridiculous theories that I'm going to point out, there are several others, I, but I'm not pointing out all of them. Uh, the vision theory. There's, a, there's something called the vision theory where Whenever the women went to the, uh, went to the tomb, they whoo, hallucinated. And they said, Jesus is alive. And they were, they were, they were uh, turned outside themselves. They didn't understand because they wanted him to be, they wanted that miracle so bad that they, they seen it. They seen it happen. Then they went back and they told everybody. And everybody believed them and then everybody died a martyr's death for. Plus, the other, the other thing that doesn't make sense about this uh, once again, is the Roman soldiers. This uproar that was coming through Christianity would not have made sense. It would not have made sense for this uproar to come up and for everybody to be losing their mind trying to figure out how to find Jesus' Jesus's body. So the vision theory does not make sense yet again. But not only do we want to look at the protests of the resurrection, but we want to look at the proof of his resurrection. And we are running out of time. But we got time. We have time. We always make time for God. We have the testimony of the scriptures. Three, verse 3 and 4 says, For I had delivered unto you the first of all, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. We have the scriptures to back up the, the biblical account. Verse 13 says, But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ, uh, then is Christ not raised, and that is very, very true. Did Jesus, uh, did Jesus Christ rise from the tomb? The Bible says he did. The Bible, the Bible says he did. If the Bible's not telling the truth about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, how can we take the Bible and apply it? Whatever it says, it so plainly and says it so clearly here. How can we take it and say, you know what? The Bible doesn't teach that and say, well, the Bible's wrong right here. How can we take that and say, the Bible's wrong here, but over here, it's right on the money. Over, over here, whenever I say this, well, I don't mind that, so that, that meets up with what I wanted to say. So therefore, I don't have to change it over here. We can't change the Bible here. We can't change the Bible here. We can't change the Bible here. We take the Bible for what the Bible says, and we put it above us, and we put it before us, and we follow it. We follow what the Bible says, and the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ died uh, he died, he was buried, and he rose again. Why, why flutter it? Why make it, why make it mucky? It cannot be trusted. On the, if it cannot be trusted on this, then it must be discounted from all things. It is our sole rule and purpose of what we hold up, what we hold before us. Not only do we have the testimony of the scriptures, but like I said before, we have the testimony of the saints. We back up to verses 5 through 7. It tells us of many people, over 500 people, um, that, that testified of seeing Jesus, who testified of seeing Jesus and of handling Jesus and being there with him, and to the point to where they gave up their life, okay? I won't, I don't understand how somebody can look at that and just discard that, oh, well, that, that, they were lying about that. They gave the ultimate price, they gave their life for this, and we, we can't just, just discredit that. Never discredit that. So if Peter, James, and John, and the others, uh, oh, I'm sorry, um, I just spoke through that one. <laughs> Nobody would die to cover up a lie. In fact, Chuck Colson, 
to just learn about this guy. Chuck Colson, uh, he was one of uh, Nixon's men who confessed to the Watergate scandal. He wouldn't, he wouldn't even lie. He wouldn't even, su- uh, he wouldn't even suffer to cover up a lie for Nixon, let alone himself. And he wasn't being persecuted. He wasn't being held to the fire, literally. He wasn't being trampled, literally throwing rocks at, not, not, not a figure of speech, but literally threw rocks at these people to, to death. Paul also saw a Christ risen on the road to Damascus, and it led to his salvation. You remember when Paul was walking to Damascus to persecute Christians, to do the thing that God told him not, or had him not doing. He thought he was being religious. He was being religious. He was following what he thought God was having him to do, and he was struck down. And he's seen Jesus, and that led to his salvation. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. The central message of Paul's gospel and that, uh, and, uh, that of the other apostles was the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it must be the central message of my sermon, of Pastor West's sermon, of Brother Matt's sermon, and of your sermons. Your, your, your preaching, when you go out into this lost and dying world, that is the theme, that is the headline, that is the message. The death, burial, and resurrection. You might start at a bunch of other, other places. You might start over here talking about tractors, or you might start over here talking about makeup, but you're going you're gonna to come to the death, burial, and resurrection if you're going to witness for Jesus Christ. Remember what Paul said over in Romans chapter 1, verse 16? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It is the power of God unto salvation. We are not ashamed of that. Don't be ashamed of that. Lastly, with three minutes left, I want to talk about the priority. The priority of the resurrection. If there be no resurrection, then Christ is not risen, according to verse 13. Unlike the, worship, unlike the people who worship these false religions, Christianity is very different. Christianity is very different, and I use this whenever I'm talking to somebody about Jesus. And it's the simple fact that you go to any religion, you go to any other religion, and you ask them, how do you get to heaven? How, what must I do to be saved? Ask the question from Acts chapter 16, verse 30, 27 through 30, something like that. Whenever the, the Philippian jailer goes to Paul and says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? You remember what Paul said? Paul was a Christian, by the way. Paul said, Believe in, the name of the, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. The Bible says to believe in the Lord, to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and believe in your mouth that God raised him from the dead, and thou shalt be saved. It's as simple as that. You, you go to Islam, you go to Catholicism, you go to any of these other religions. I'll call them all out. You go to any of these religions, and they're, the bucket don't hold water. You can't get anywhere with these. Because they're saying that it is of you. Is what, what can you do to hold on to your salvation? What can you do to obtain your salvation? How high on the ladder can you climb to get to heaven? And that is the opposite of what Jesus, what Jesus taught. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He taught, it's not about what you do. It's not about what you can do. It's about what I've already done. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I shall be saved. Coming into an agreement with Jesus, how wicked your sin is. Confess your sin. What is stopping us? from being closer to God tonight than we've ever been before. Our pride. That could be the only thing. Don't let, don't let it hold you up. Get closer to God even tonight. If there be no resurrection, then the apostles were false witnesses. The apostles were false witnesses. They say, they, they, uh, somehow they got all these people, hundreds of people, to lie. They had all these people to, to uh, dis, discredit or to, to lie, to stand up and say, you know what, Jesus actually did, did, uh, did raise from the dead, and we've seen him. And the, the disciples got a lot of people hurt and killed. The disciples were kind of jerks that Jesus wasn't risen from the dead. Paul himself was an enemy of Christ, Jesus, but meeting uh, Meeting with the risen Lord dramatically changed his life. It really changed what, kind of, what his thoughts were. It really changed what his mission was. You know, he still went to Damascus, right? He still went there. He just had different goals. He had different plans. He had different vision. 
Christ coming up from the dead, Christ rising from the dead, changes all our dreams, all our hopes, all our ambition to where we're not seeing what we don't need to look at what we can become, but we need to look at what Jesus wants us to become, what God wants us to do. There's a difference. If there be no resurrection, our faith is vain. If there be no resurrection, resurrection, then your faith is vain. There's no point. The good news, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ doesn't make any sense. And if you take one away, this is a tripod. If you take one away, it crumbles. It it doesn't stand. It doesn't make sense. Jesus told his disciples that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men to be crucified and three days later rise again. If the resurrection hadn't been fulfilled, then Jesus would stand uh, convicted as a false prophet. Everything hinges on this. Are you getting the picture? I think I've said it several times. The resurrection isn't just, uh, oh yeah, by the way, he was also, he rose. Easter's a big deal. Easter is a big deal. If there be no resurrection, then we are yet in our sin. If there be no resurrection, then everything else still applies. For all has sinned and come short of the glory of God. For the wages of your sin is death. That, and that, that's where it ended at. You wouldn't have but the gift of God is eternal life to Jesus Christ our Lord. Because Jesus Christ is a maniac. If there be no resurrection, then this, then Jesus is nothing. Jesus is as good as any other uh, prophets who came up. Or uh, false prophets who came up and, and, and went to the side. But glory be to God. Glory be to God. That there is a resurrection. Now don't be taking that out of context. That, that comes into context right here. Pastor West, I know. If there be no resurrection, then the dead in Christ, your loved ones are gone. Your loved ones are no more. You never see them again. They are they are worm dirt. They have nothing. They have they have no you have no memories worth keeping of them. Because it's gone. If there be no resurrection, then we have no joy. Nor do we have hope. If we have no resurrection, then this is pointless. It's not church. But life, if there be no resurrection, there's no reason to wake up. But I know whom I believe in. I am persuaded that he's able to save me, to save you, to take us. I know that he's risen from the dead. I know the Lord Jesus Christ is risen and he's alive today. How do I know? Because I talked to him just this morning about it. I asked him this morning about it. You know, in our, in our study, this is one of our doctrinal statements, by the way. So if you don't know really about the church, we have different statements, doctrinal statements. And that's kind of how we stand, what we stand, stand by as a, uh, as a church. It's what we believe in. And this is one of our doctrinal statements. And we went over this a couple weeks back in our class. And it's a very important thing. But I know that the resurrection happened because I, I, I can feel it. I can see it. I trust it. I can read it. You can do the same. You can see the same. Your faith is in if your if your faith is in anything other than the resurrection of Jesus Christ tonight. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. If you understand what I'm saying, then you need to be down here at the altar. Praying in your pew is fantastic, but this altar, this altar is amazing. I remember whenever I was a young, whenever I was a child, the altar used to fill up. There used to be people come down here all the way down here, and they would actually submit themselves to their knees and cry, cry to God. We, we like to blame the generation. We like to blame everything that's going wrong on these generation things. But I've, I've yet to see, too, I, I've seen some, I haven't seen too many tears on these cushions down here. Does that, does that convict us? I know it convicts me. I'm going to have us rise and have a, Gabriel, wherever you are at, come forward. Go ahead and lead uh, our musicians. Come on forward. And I want you to think about something this night. All, all rise. It's like a courtroom. Jesus Christ tells us many things in this Bible. We're, I, I heard a quote a while back. Um, and I, I've held, held to it ever since that I'm just as close to Christ as I want to be. Pastor West told me that 
And it made me think about how close do I want to be to God? I mean, the closer I get to God, the more, the, the uglier I look. The more wrong I see myself, the more I see what I need to change. And I would, I would just venture out to say that if you looked at yourself and compared you to God, you'd fall a little short. And if you don't, if you don't think you would, then uh, you need to pray about your humility. It is a time. It's time to come back to God. It's time to come to his altar, to let go of stubbornness, to let go of, of these, uh, the, these thoughts of being so supreme, such a, higher, such, a, such a higher person than this person over here. Let it go. Understand who you are in the sight of God and allow the altar to do what the altar does. Break your hearts. Break my heart. And make me see who I am so I can understand who Jesus Christ is. Jesus died. He was buried and he rose again. The resurrection is key. Whether you believe that or not, that's what happened. The Bible told me so. And I'm just asking you to consider it once more. If you don't know who Jesus Christ is, your Lord and Savior, the Bible tells me to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. Confess who you are. Come into an agreement with God about who you are. Confess with, uh, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and I shall be saved. It's as simple as a child can do it. But can, 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 we, can we honestly say that that's where we're at today? And if it is, fantastic. 